Hey, I know you. You're that jaywalking punk anarchist. You're that jaywalking punk anarchist. Jaywalking punk anarchist. Hello, this is the Radical Reviewer taking a look at The Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. The edition I have is by Flaquarian Press, 2005, originally published in 1848. The key idea of this text is to critique capitalism and to establish communism as the one true solution to capitalism's ills, and with that, to explain the goals of communism, namely to seize the means of production for the working class, to replace the political and economic power of the capitalist class with a classless egalitarian society, and to support worker revolutions seeking these ends at every stage of development all over the world. Now this text does not get into the specific functions of society and the economy the way a book like Paracon does. There's no detailed explanations of affinity groups, direct or electoral democracy, central planning, or anything like that. So don't look to the Communist Manifesto as a guide to a communist society. Instead, the text functions as a brief overview of the rationale and values of communism. Let's take a look at the text in depth. Now, I've just come off of watching a few ASMR Communist Manifesto videos, so I'm definitely good and prepared for this review. So let's dive into it. Chapter 1. Bourgeois and Proletarians In this chapter, Marx and Engels critique capitalism's need for growth and accumulation, and they define the terms bourgeoisie and proletariat. And for the sake of this video, I'll be using the terms bourgeoisie, bourgeois, rich perverts, and capitalists interchangeably, and I'll be using the terms proletariat and working class interchangeably. So don't get lost now. These terms mean the same thing. To establish the historical framework of the text, Marx and Engels state, The history of all hitherto existing societies is the history of class struggles. Freedman and slave, patrician and plebeian, lord and serf, guildmaster and journeyman, in a word, oppressor and oppressed, stood in constant opposition to one another. Okay, so all human history, in every society, there has been a struggle between the haves and the have-nots. Those who own the power, the land, the resources, the factories, the means of production, and those who don't. Marx and Engels explain that this divide is getting worse under capitalism, and two classes have formed, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Okay, so society is divided into two classes, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, the capitalist and the worker. Well, what defines these two groups? Well, under capitalism, there are many ways to make money, but when it comes down to it, there are really only two ways to make a living. You either live primarily off your own labor, or you live primarily off the labor of others. Some people have stocks, and bonds, and hedge funds, and investments, and land, and factories, and trademarks, and copyrights, and natural resources, but most people have primarily their own labor power. Now, of course, someone who lives principally off the labor of others might also have a job, do work, and receive a salary, and some working class people might have a pension, or some stocks, or even a small business. But the distinction is very clear. The capitalist lives primarily off the labor of others, and the proletariat lives primarily off their own labor. These are the two main classes in capitalist society. And Marx and Engels argue that these two classes are antagonistic. For example, capitalists and workers want exactly the opposite in the workplace. As a worker, you might want higher wages, a pension, paid time off, guaranteed job security, etc., and the capitalist wants none of those things. Instead, the capitalist wants longer hours, higher productivity, no paid leave, no job security, etc., and of course the worker wants none of those things. In short, the worker wants to work at the least intensity for the most pay, and the capitalist wants the worker to work as hard as they can for as little pay as possible. Okay, now that we've fully explored the bourgeoisie-proletariat distinction, let's get back to the text. Marx and Engels explore capitalism and the bourgeoisie's impact on the world, stating, The need of a constantly expanding market for its products chases the bourgeoisie over the whole surface of the globe. It must nestle everywhere, settle everywhere, establish connections everywhere. This means that capitalism always needs to grow and expand. Or, as David Harvey has stated, Capitalism never solves its crisis problems. It moves them around geographically. The argument is that capitalism requires constant compound growth and expansion to survive, 
and that means expanding all over the world into every aspect of life in order to exploit it for profit. Profiting from your desire to have a cheeseburger and profiting from your desire to survive a car accident. Capitalism even seeks profit from wars, calamities, and disasters, as the book The Shock Doctrine, which I did a review for by the way, has shown. Looking at capitalism's need for growth, Marx and Engels claim that the bourgeoisie are like the sorcerer who is no longer able to control the powers of the netherworld whom he has called up by his spells. This is because capitalism has drives to expand and accumulate and exploit that are outside the control of the capitalists themselves. The documentary The Corporation lends itself to this argument well. The documentary essentially argues that if corporations are people, then they are psychopaths because of their uncontrollable drives. Despite what's best for society or the world, less production, less waste, less pollution, less environmental destruction, capitalism must, in ever-expanding quantities, accumulate and exploit. And this drive for accumulation and exploitation leads to more problems. Marx and Engels examine the epidemic of overproduction. Society suddenly finds itself put back into a state of momentary barbarism. It appears as if a famine, a universal war of devastation, had cut off the supply of every means of subsistence. Industry and commerce seem to be destroyed. And why? Because there is too much civilization, too much means of subsistence, too much industry, too much commerce. Essentially, in a fight to produce more and more, cheaper and cheaper, and, at the same time, a fight for greater need and scarcity, we end up with a society where there is all this work to be done, and yet no jobs are available. Food fills landfills while millions go hungry. Millions of empty homes, and yet millions are homeless. We have a society where we produce so much that everyone could easily have more than enough, and yet people go without. That is because capitalism is not interested in fulfilling needs, it is interested in maintaining needs. It would absolutely destroy capitalism to provide for free the excesses of food and shelter which the people of the world desperately need. Marx and Engels continue. And how does the bourgeoisie get over these crises? On one hand, enforced destruction of a mass of productive forces. On the other, by the conquest of new markets and by the more thorough exploitation of old ones. That is to say, by paving the way for more extensive and more destructive crises by diminishing the means whereby crises are prevented. So what does this look like in practice? This is destroying unions, cutting government programs, inflation, deindustrialization, capital flight, mass layoffs, ghettoization, the works. This leads to depressions and, contrary to popular belief, capitalism likes depressions. Competitors are destroyed, unions are weakened and destroyed, inflation eats up people's meager wages, people become desperate, and start taking jobs they never thought they'd have at pay they didn't think they would accept. This concept of capitalism exploiting desperation and crisis for profit again perfectly parallels with the book The Shock Doctrine, as I mentioned earlier. Now, if capitalism has so many problems, it makes sense the workers would want to revolt. How does capitalism deal with this? Marx and Engels explain, As privates in the industrial army, they are placed under the command of a perfect hierarchy of officers and sergeants, not only are they slaves to the bourgeois class and of the bourgeois state, they are daily and hourly enslaved by the machine, by the overlooker, and above all, by the individual bourgeois manufacturer himself. Now, when I worked fast food, my actions were always waited on at every moment. I was a slave to the screen that tells me what to cook, a slave to the timer of each cooking item, a slave to the timer of when the order was taken, and to my fellow team members who are pushing me to go faster because they are trying to meet the deadlines of their own timers, and to the team leader who is punished if these times are not met, and the assistant manager above the team leader, and the manager above them, and the district manager above them, and the regional manager above them, and the chairman over them, and the vice president over them, and the CEOs over them, board of directors over them, shareholders over them, and at every incremental step in this process, failure to obey could mean losing my job, and therefore losing my ability to access food and shelter. Now, of course, fast food is a simple example of this, but controls like these exist at all jobs. Hey, what aspects of your employment form complex hierarchies of slavery to keep you in line? Try it at home! Back to the text. Even with all this control, workers do fight back, and Marx and Engels look at workers fighting against these crises in capitalism, and they state, 
Now and then, the workers are victorious, but only for a time. The real fruit of their battle lies not in the immediate result, but in the ever-expanding union of the workers. This union is helped by the improved means of communication that are created by modern industry and that place the workers of different localities in contact with one another. Okay, two big ideas to unpack here. First, the real fruit of their battle lies not in the immediate result, but in the ever-expanding union of workers. This is very important. The implication of this is that with every victory of working people, the capitalists will try and roll it back. So the ultimate goal is revolution. Not simply reform, but full-fledged revolution. This is because capitalism is extremely resilient. Little reforms here and there, raising the wages, paid maternity leave, etc., are always subject to rollbacks if the capitalist system is maintained. The second idea is the idea that this union is helped by the improved means of communication that are created by modern industry. Obviously, Marx and Engels aren't clairvoyant and could not anticipate the evolution of communication over the next 170 years. But let's take a minute to talk about this improved communication and this little thing called the internet. Now, there's a lot of truth in Marx and Engels' claim. For example, Black Lives Matter spreading stories of police oppression that the media ignores. Same for the murder of trans persons. Or when oppressed groups use the internet to ask questions that the media is not asking, etc., etc. I mean, if you're here on YouTube, you are probably subscribed to various channels that are providing you with information you would not have access to in the mainstream media. But there are drawbacks to this. Information overload can cause apathy. People spend a lot of time arguing the finer points of an issue that is of little or no importance in the larger context, i.e. lifestyle activism, identity politics, etc. Another issue is that with so much information available, people with incorrect opinions have a wealth of information to draw from and back up their false ideas. Also, creating something online, like a YouTube video for example, can lead a person to feel like they've created real political change when they actually didn't do anything. Um, that's depressing. Back to the text. So we've looked at capitalism's need to grow, causing crises, and we've looked at the working class, both enslaved by and rebelling against the bourgeoisie. Now, there's one last leaf to overturn, the middle class. Marx and Engels state, They are reactionary, for they try to roll back the wheel of history. If, by chance, they are revolutionary, they are so only in the view of their impending transfer into the proletariat. What this means is that the lower middle class strike out against the poor in order to avoid becoming poor themselves. We've seen this in action historically. We can look at the reactionary Nazi party, or the angry white men issue of the Reagan years, and of our own time for that matter. Barbara Ehrenreich's book, The Fear of Falling, does a great job of addressing this issue of a reactionary middle class in America. Okay, so capitalism's need to accumulate and expand makes it uncontrollably seek profit from all over the world and every aspect of society, leading to extreme exploitation and economic crisis. Marx and Engels conclude, Here it becomes evident that the bourgeoisie is unfit any longer to be the ruling class in society and to impose its conditions of existence upon society as an overriding law. The essential condition for the existence and for the sway of the bourgeois class is the formation and augmentation of capital. The condition for capital is wage labor. What the bourgeoisie therefore produces above all is its own grave diggers. Its fall and the victory of the proletariat are equally inevitable. Very exciting. One chapter down. Only one big chapter and two little chapters to go. You're doing great. We're doing great. Let's break up the pace. Here's a video of me drinking from a hose as a baby. Okay, you good? Let's move on. Chapter 2. Proletarians and Communists Having critiqued capitalism, this chapter is about explaining communism. For example, that communism will destroy private property and destroy inequality. 
and turn everyone into mindless drones and turn everything gray and destroy liberty and freedom and destroy mom, God, and apple pie. Yes, it's all true. The globalists, the cultural Marxists, the Illuminati form an evil trinity in line with Satan to institute gender-neutral bathrooms, pay paternity leave, and bread lines, thus ensuring the coming of the Antichrist. So let's dive into it. Well, we saw in chapter one that the communists are calling for revolution rather than simple reform. And how is this revolution going to be achieved? Marx and Engels explain. In this sense, the theory of the communists may be summed up in the single sentence, abolition of private property. This is because the ownership of money-making property is the crux of inequality in capitalist society. We forget that all land was once owned in common. All land and resources are publicly owned until they're stolen and turned into private property. It seems like the way things always have been, but it was actually quite revolutionary to have the communal lands be stolen and placed into private hands. And it still happens today. New technologies such as cell phones and the internet are created with public funding and public institutions and then given away to private corporations. But wait, isn't owning private property how we secure freedom and liberty? Is communism about destroying freedom and liberty? Well, Marx and Engels explain that for the capitalist society, freedom and liberty primarily means freedom to privately own the means of production, which is a freedom very few people can actually enjoy. Marx and Engels state, You are horrified at our intending to do away with private property, but in your existing society, private property is already done away with for nine-tenths of the population. Its existence for the few is solely due to its non-existence in the hands of those nine-tenths. This isn't rocket science. There is only so much land and only so much resources. If Monsanto is expressing its freedom by owning X percent of the grain market, they're in fact destroying everyone else's freedom to use those resources in a more democratic and egalitarian way. Same goes for mining companies doing mountaintop removal, a lumber company clear-cutting a forest, a company dumping pollution, etc., etc. Under capitalism, these companies are simply expressing their freedom, but in reality, they are using their claim to private ownership to destroy the freedom of everyone else from creating a more democratic and equitable alternative. The people of Flint, Michigan didn't vote to have their water poisoned. The people of Louisiana didn't vote for Cancer Alley. The people of the Rust Belt, and everywhere else for that matter, didn't vote for deindustrialization. We didn't vote for a vast array of technological advances made at public expense in public institutions to be given away to corporations to exploit for private profit. It turns out the important decisions don't happen when I choose to take a product off the shelf. They happen when companies and governments decide what products should go on the shelves. Having explained communism's goals, Marx and Engels outline a plan of how to achieve those goals. Firstly, the proletariat must win political power, and then pass the following ten policies, often called the ten planks, to ensure a communist revolution. These ten planks are 1. Abolition of property in land and application of all rents of land to public purposes. That is, abolition of private property, which we already looked at. Planks 2 through 4 are pretty standard wealth redistribution measures that shouldn't need too much explanation. Two a heavy progressive and gradual income tax, three, abolition of all right of inheritance, four, confiscation of the property of all immigrants and rebels. Oh, uh, wait, number four is a tricky one. Confiscation of the property of all immigrants and rebels? Let's look at this. Well, if you're in the first world, the concept of confiscating property from immigrants sounds problematic, but let's look at somewhere like Cuba. Here, confiscating property from immigrants and rebels means taking resources out of the hands of foreign capitalists and multinationals and the property of rebelling capitalists at home and converting that property into public ownership for the benefit of local populations. Leading off of number four, the last measures five through ten are all about ensuring democratic ownership. They're about converting those various institutions from private for-profit control and converting them into public ownership for the public good. 5. Centralization of credit in the hands of the state by means of a national bank with state capital and an exclusive monopoly. This means having loans and other bank functions publicly owned for the use of public good rather than privately owned for the purpose of making profit. 6. 
Centralization of the means of communication and transportation in the hands of the state. Again, public rather than private ownership. Seven, extension of factories and instruments of production owned by the state, the bringing into cultivation of wastelands, and the improvement of the soil generally in accordance with a common plan. Not much to explain there. Eight, equal liability of all to labor, establishment of industrial armies, especially for agriculture. This is strengthening unions in the working class. Nine, combination of agriculture with manufacturing industries, gradual abolition of the distinction between town and country by a more equable distribution of the population over the country. This is about breaking down the hierarchy between urban and rural. And finally, number 10, free education for all children in public schools, abolition of children's factory labor in its present form, combination of education with industrial protection, etc., etc. If the proletariat take over state power and institute these 10 planks, Marx and Engels conclude the proletariat state will have gotten rid of the bourgeoisie, gotten rid of classes, and so, therefore, also gotten rid of the need for its own existence and the state will dissolve. So the theory goes. There's a lot of debate about this. For example, claiming that the poor of the first world would try to stop rather than try to join a communist revolution in the third world. Also, there's a debate about if the communist state would dissolve because a communist country might need a state to defend itself from invasion. As Bloom and Parenti and many other authors have demonstrated, capitalist imperialism is quick to crush any alternative economy from emerging, etc., etc. In any case, Marx and Engels propose that after these ten planks are instituted, the state will dissolve, society will become classless, and Marx and Engels conclude, In place of the old bourgeois society, with its classes and class antagonisms, we shall have an association in which the free development of each is the condition for the free development of all. Chapter 3. Socialists and Communist Literature In this chapter, Marx and Engels are defining various forms of socialism and communism. This is probably the most dated chapter of the text because it's specific to the historical development of events at the time, but let's quickly run through them. First, reactionary socialism. This was essentially groups who used socialism as a reactionary movement to try and go back to feudalism or some other old social relation. Second, conservative or bourgeois socialism. This form of socialism is essentially the modern day liberal. Just look at how Marx and Engels describe it. The socialistic bourgeois wants all the advantages of modern social conditions without the struggles and dangers necessarily resulting therefrom. They desire the existing state of society minus its revolutionary and disintegrating elements. They wish for a bourgeoisie without a proletariat. This is the coexist bumper sticker, lifestyle activism, all talk and no action liberal. They work for capitalism with a friendly face, raising the minimum wage, ignoring sweatshops, a few humanitarian drone strikes here and there, and a Black Lives Matter lawn sign in a wealthy all-white suburban neighborhood. And don't ever call for the overthrow of capitalism. And lastly, the third variation discussed is critical utopian socialism and communism. This was essentially a call for socialism that happened too soon before philosophical and material conditions would allow for a true revolution. And so there you have it. Marx and Engels lay out three failed alternatives to communism. Moving right along. Finally, chapter four. Position of the communists in relation to the various existing opposition parties. Continuing this look at what was going on politically at the time, this chapter starts with historical references to socialist and communist movements in Switzerland, Poland, and Germany. Again, references that were relevant at the time and are interesting for historical understanding of the period, but are, again, not entirely relevant for understanding the philosophy of communism. And for the final grand pronouncements of the text, Marx and Engels state, the communists everywhere support every revolutionary movement against the existing social and political order of things. And Marx and Engels conclude, They labor everywhere for the union and agreement of the democratic parties of all countries. The communists disdain to conceal their views and aims. They openly declare that their ends can be attained only by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. 
let the ruling class tremble at the communistic revolution. Their proletarians have nothing to lose but their chains. They have a world to win. Working men of all countries unite. Conclusion. Well, you have your mission, fellow workers. Let's use our advanced communication to embolden our ranks, seize the political power, and institute the ten planks, destroy all private property, and seize the means of production. Let's spread our revolution to every corner of the globe at every stage of development and create an equitable, egalitarian, utopian communist society which spans the globe! Uh, okay, so it's a little more complicated than that. And a lot has changed in the 170 years since the book was published. 170 years ago, sweatshop workers such as the IWW stood a chance demanding change. Nowadays, with advanced technology, security cameras, metal detectors, various accoutrements of repression, and repressive military might backed by the deep pockets of the first world, folks suffering sweatshop conditions in the third world have a much more challenging road ahead than the workers in the 1900s. And at the same time, in the first world, the various cheap luxury comforts such as Uber Eats, social media, video games, streaming video, encourage passivity and apathy. The poorest people of the first world are perhaps much more likely to cling to these cheap comforts and have a reactionary response to a worker revolution than a supportive one. Now this doesn't mean that the theories here are wrong. In fact, the critiques of capitalism and the critiques of the reformist solutions in the text are eerily relevant. What this does mean, however, is that the conclusions and solutions for capitalism in the Communist Manifesto must be updated against the last 170 years of technological innovation and capitalist evolution and expansion. This is why I personally prefer Pericon, which I did a review for, by the way. It's a modern solution to capitalism. So what is my conclusion? Well, the Communist Manifesto's critique of capitalism and the critique of the alternatives established as the cure for capitalism's ills, in this regard, the Communist Manifesto has remained incredibly relevant. If you're interested in a quick read briefly outlining communism's critique of capitalism and a brief overview of what communism offers as a solution, then I highly recommend this seminal work. If you're interested in radical theory, looking for a book recommendation or whatever, you can get your radical book reviews here with the Radical Reviewer. Thanks for watching.